Good morning, today we're going to be going through the unit CHC AGE 001, which is in facilitate the empowerment of older people. So the objectives of this unit. So we want to discover and develop relationships with older people. We want to learn how we can deliver the best possible service to these people. Also while maintaining their health and well-being in a holistic way, this holistic way means that we're going to look after the entirety of the person. We're not just going to look after their medical condition. We want to get to the crux of who these people are. The way we're going to do this is through communication. So we need to conduct interpersonal exchanges in a manner that promotes the empowerment and delivers and maintains trust within your relationship with your clients. We need to try and find if we have something in common with our clients. If there's a hobby that they like, that we like, that gives us something to be able to communicate with them about. We wanna be interested in their lives and who is in their life. It could be friends, it could be family, it could be a pet. We wanna take an interest in their life. We also want to look at some nonverbal cues. So we need to make sure that our body language is matching what's coming out of our mouth. And we need to pick up on their body cues as well. Not everybody is outgoing and chatty. Some people are more reserved and shy. So we need to have a look at these body cues on how they're holding themselves and try to interpret what type of person our client is to best adapt our communication strategy towards them. So we want to use some empowering phrases. So we ask open-ended questions to try and get the communication flowing. So things like, it sounds like you're really interested in fishing. What sort of fishing do you like? So this is going to open up an open line of communication where they can then go on and say, I like deep sea fishing or I like fishing off the beach or off the rocks. And it's going to get that free flow of communication going. We want to be able to validate what our clients are saying to us and let them know that it's okay to feel certain ways about certain things. So we, how we do that is we're going to go back and say, so I understand that you feel like da, da, da. And that's okay to feel like that. I can understand why you feel like that. Using those types of phrases is going to build a trusting and comfortable relationship with your client. Negative and disempowering phrases. So this is attempting to rescue the client from all their problems. We don't wanna do that. We wanna be able to assist them and help them through these problems so that they feel like they've solved these issues on their own. Okay, so we don't wanna to ask too many questions. We don't wanna come across as nosy but we want to come across as interested. So there's a fine line there. And how we do that is through our pitch and our tone of our voice. We don't want it to be coming across as too full on. So we want to soften the pitch and our tone in our voice and have it as more of a, a higher tone where it's more interested in finding out rather than wanting to find out for more sticky beak reasons. We don't want to tell them to stop worrying because that's not validating how they feel. We want to do the opposite actually. We want to say it's okay to worry and feel like that about whatever issue they're experiencing. I'm here to help and assist you through any way possible to help you get over this problem. We want to make sure that they understand that we're paying attention. So how we do this is we repeat things back to the client that they've said to us. So I understand that you wanted to go through this channel, or I under understand that you wanted to do it this way. This is then explaining to them that we understand what they're talking about and we're on board with assisting them. So here we're going to go through our first element, which is recognize and respect older people's social, cultural and spiritual differences. So here in Australia, we have a lot of different cultures and a lot of different walks of life. So we need to be respectful of those cultures. So we may come across a number of cultural issues, all of which should be handled with sensitivity, care and respect. So we want to find out what we can do to assist 
in any area that we can. So we want to provide an equal service across the board to all our clients. So this is being non-judgmental. It's not putting our opinions and judgments onto that client if we don't necessarily agree with something that they do in their culture. We are there to provide assistance and support. Our judgments and our opinions are meant to be left in our own minds. This is going to ensure that we're not going to be discriminatory towards our clients. As we are under the legislation and as there is an Anti-Discrimination Act that you'll become familiar with with your legal unit, we need to ensure that these clients from different cultural backgrounds are feeling safe and secure within their environment. So next we're going to go on and talk about maintaining confidentiality and privacy of the person within the organisation. So if your client tells you things, we need to ensure that we, mean, we need to maintain their privacy and confidentiality. Yes, we can put it down in their progress notes. Yes, we can tell our colleagues at a handover if our client is distressed, depressed or upset over a certain thing or if it's an anniversary of a death or a passing of someone. Yes, we can talk about that information with our colleagues. What we don't do is then go out for dinner and talk about it with our spouse and our family about Mrs. X told me this today. Because we don't know, Mrs. X's grandchildren might be sitting on the table next to us and they're going to pick up very quickly that we're talking about their grandparent. So we need to make sure that we keep our privacy and our confidentiality in the forefront of our mind at all times. We never take any documentation home from the organisation as this is also a breach of privacy and confidentiality towards your clients. So confidentiality is required by law. It contains, respects the privacy of clients' records and is highly important aspect of confidentiality. So when we're talking about our clients' records, we need to ensure that these are kept in a safe and secure environment. We cannot just have client records sitting out on nurses' station benches for anyone that can walk past to see. They need to be in a password-protected computer that only authorised personnel shall have the password to, or they need to be locked up in a secure cabinet, and only authorised personnel will have the key to that secure cabinet. This is to ensure that our clients' privacy and confidentiality when it comes to their medical records is maintained at all times. There is punishment by law towards yourself or the organisation if this legislation is not adhered to. So, as I mentioned earlier, we never discuss client information in social circles. Documentation information should only ever relate to the service delivery and related factors. Confidential document, documents must be stored securely. Client information should never be disclosed to external agencies. And names and details of clients should not be disclosed in public. When can it be breached? So if the person is at serious risk of harm or is threatening to risk others, with harm. So for example, if I had a client that came to me and said, Cara, I'm not happy and I want to end my life. This is what I'm going to do to do it. I have a responsibility to take that to my supervisor and say, Mr. X has told me X, Y, Z information. That is not going to breach his confidentiality in a negative way because I am there to ensure the wellness of that client. So if he is threatening to harm himself or others, I have all the right to be able to take that to my supervisor and inform him or her of what I have been told. Where the rights stop is I do not have the right to go to the restaurant and sit there and tell my husband and children about what this client has talked to me about today. So it's got to maintain within the organisation of the client, within the authorised personnel, that look after that client and in a respectful manner as well. So work with people to identify physical and social enablers and disablers impacting on health outcomes and quality of life. Okay, so enablers are factors that encourage people to do something. So for example, to attend a class. That's enabling you to become better 
to grow, to mature, to learn something new. So that's a positive aspect on your life. Disablers are the factors that discourage people from doing something. So for example, if you had an elderly client that wanted to go to the concert downstairs of the organisation, and you said to them, okay, we can do that. What do we need to be able to get you there? Do we need to get you a wheelchair? Do we need to get you a wheelie walker? Is it a one person assist? Is it a two person assist? So you're going to put all these positive things in place to ensure that that client gets to that concert. So to do the opposite, which is to disable, is to sit there and say to them, look, you don't really want to go down to that concert. It's going to be too much hassle. I'm sure you'll just hear it from where we're sitting now. So, disablers, they come up with health problems, fear of falling. So often you'll find a client that's had quite an extensive fall before, they become fearful of falling again and hurting themselves. Inconvenience, they will sit there and they'll say to you, oh, it's, it's too much on you, it's going to inconvenience or burden you. Transport issues, it's going to be too much for me to get there. Their self-esteem. So if they have had a fall or if something significant has happened in their life and their self-esteem has copped a knock, it's really hard for them to be able to come back out of that comfort zone, which is the lack of self-esteem that they're feeling now, and to build themselves back up at that age. So what we have to do is we have to try and help them build it up. So we tell them positive affirmations. We say, you're doing a great job. You look lovely today. It's a beautiful day outside. Let's go out for a walk in the sun. We're going to give all these positive information over to try and build up that self-esteem. Okay, so enablers. So this, the positive outcomes are social benefits, health benefits. They're getting out, they're socializing, they're using their mind, they're using their brain. It's helping them mentally. You know, they, they're getting some more drive. They're feeling like they have a purpose to get up that morning. Key issues facing older people. So big one, stereotypes and ageism. You'll often hear throughout the community when it comes to whether it's the aged community, the disabled community, there'll be a bunch of stereotypes around it. Some of these that you might hear is a disabled person cannot hold employment because they're disabled. That's a stereotype, that's a myth, it's not correct. You'll hear with the elderly that they're all senile or they're all cranky, they're always tired. That's not correct, it's a stereotype, so it's a myth. And these knock-on effects to these people in the community are pretty devastating because they constantly are hearing these stereotypes and myths when they go out. So is it just not easier just to stay at home and not have to deal with it? Or would it be better that we as the community changed our way of thinking? Okay, so we need to encourage the person to adopt a shared responsibility for their own support. So this means we're going to achieve better health outcomes and quality of life. So what we want to do is we want to promote choice and independence towards our clients. Our biggest thing is that we rush in and we've got so much to do that we tend to take over. That's not promoting choice and independence. You know, these people need to feel like they have a purpose when they wake up in the morning. So asking Mrs X if she wants to wear a yellow blouse or a pink blouse only takes 30 seconds out of your day, but it's going to make her feel important that she's made that choice on how she looks today. Asking them if they want soup or a sandwich for lunch gives them the empowerment of, of making those choices where they feel that they still have that in them to make those choices. But we need to provide the choices for them to make. Promoting independence is if you're doing meal preparation or if you're washing someone or attending to their personal hygiene needs, is asking them to have a go at brushing their hair first or brushing their own teeth first. Yes, they might not be able to do all of it, but give them the opportunity to have a go and still use those fine motor skills and those major motor skills to be able to have a go at doing those things. You're there to assist, you're not there to take over. There's a big difference. 
So it's important to remember that these changes might happen over time. As people become more progressed through their illnesses, there'll be less that they'll be able to do. So their independence will change, their mobility will change. You know, their, their mental stability to make choices will change. And we need to adapt and change with them. But it doesn't mean that we stop trying to empower them. We stop trying to promote independence and choice just because their medical history has changed. So the client's responsibilities. You'll need to agree what it is and what they are willing to do for themselves. So this could change on a shift to shift basis. What they'll be willing to do for themselves one day, they might not feel like doing the other day. And that's perfectly fine, because that's what you're there for, is to help and assist them. Okay, so an example here, the client needs help with transport to and from places, but makes and keeps appointments, such as doctors, dentists. So we're going to encourage them to make the phone calls. Yes, we might assist them to get the number. Yes, we might assist them to dial the number, but we're going to give them the phone to make the phone call and to make the appointment. Where we then come in, we're going to assist transporting them to that appointment. See how it's going that you're promoting the independence, but you're also there to assist. So then we're going to go on to identify and discuss services which empower an older person. So these are things like aids or assistive equipment. So it could be a telephone that has bigger number on it. It could be adaptive cutlery, so they can still use a knife and fork, but we've had to get a modified version of it. It could also be a walking stick. It could be home modifications by putting in a ramp or putting in handrails to be able to help them feel safer in a shower, to assist them getting up over the toilet. So we have to have a look at these things that we can put into place for our client to be able to promote their independence and empower them to keep moving forward. Next, we're going to go on to support the older person to express their own identity and preferences without imposing our own attitude. So here we want to make them feel that they are unique and they are individual. And that's why we're going to promote choice with what do they want to wear? What would they like to eat? It might not be what I want, but that's okay because I'm me and they're them, and that's okay. We wanna be there to assist them and promote their wellness. How I feel about it stays in my head. There's no room for judgment, there's no room for opinion. You are purely there to assist the well-being of your client. So how do we do this? We sit down and we have a chat with our client. We have a chat with their friends and their families, their neighbours, whoever comes in to see them. And we talk to them about what they're interested in. We find out a little bit of background about what hobbies they did when they were younger, what they did for a living. And we can use those things to draw on and reminisce and use them to communicate with our client and have a better understanding of who they are and why they are who they are. We also talk about our client's preferences. So this is where we're going to sit there and have a consultation with our client. We're going to ask them a series of questions of things like, when do they prefer to have a shower? Do they prefer to have a shower in the morning or in the evening? Do they prefer to have their main meal during the day rather than at night? You know, do they prefer to wear stockings instead of trousers? All those sorts of things we're going to document in a thing called their care plan so that when new onboarding staff come on, they can have a look over this client's individual care plan and get a five second snap of what this person likes, dislikes, their preferences, before they go in and start to interact with them. So here we adjust our services. So, Mr. X wants to have a shower at four o'clock in the afternoon instead of eight o'clock in the morning. So we adjust our services to meet his needs. Provide services according to organisation policies, procedures and duty of care requirements. Okay, so as a support worker, you work under a duty of care. As you would have read through numerous learner guides by now, your duty of care is your legal obligation to ensure that no unforeseen harm comes to a client whilst in your care. Your organisation's policies and procedures. 
So this is a set of documents or manuals that are put together by that organisation of which you work under. So it's a set of guidelines. So here we have a set of guidelines and we have the law and we mesh them together and that is what you're going to be working under. So how does it work? Well, you only perform duties within the scope of your knowledge. So the scope of your knowledge, if you are a support worker, you have a job description outlining the duties that you have signed and are willing to undertake. As a registered nurse, I can't then go and ask you to do something above your scope of knowledge. So for example, if I asked you to give out an S8 drug to a client, that is above and beyond the scope of your knowledge. So you would refuse to do that. You should never attempt to carry out or provide professional advice on something that you're not qualified to do. You should also know what to do when you're unsure of your job role and work instructions. So if you have had a supervisor come up to you and has asked you to do a particular task and you're not sure how to do that task or how to do that task with that client, we have the expectation of you as support workers to be able to come to your supervisor and say, I'm not sure how to do this. Can you please assist me how to do it so that I know for next time? So we have our legislation that we work under. So we currently are working under the Aged Care Act, our Anti-Discrimination Act and the Residential Care Manual. So assist the older person to understand their rights and complaint mechanisms of the organisation. So this is to be able to sit down with your client and give them an overview of their rights as a client within the organisation. If they are not happy with something, what is that organisation's complaint process? Does it go to a supervisor verbally? Does it need to be in writing to a director? You need to be able to clearly go through your organisation's complaints process with your client and ensure that they have an understanding of what they need to do if they are not happy or satisfied with the service they're receiving. So some of the topics that they could not be happy with that they may wish to want to complain about is their quality of care. They might have a particular support worker that they just don't get along well with and they want to take that worker off their service. They have the right to do that. They may not be receiving the quality of care from that particular worker, and they have that right to complain. The choice of activities. So this could come down to they're doing things like table bobs or reminiscing or concerts, but you've got a gentleman there that has been a woodworker his entire life that isn't interested in doing those activities. So the diversional therapist in the organisation needs to ensure that there is activities that are spread across the board that are going to cover all of the interests and preference of the clients in the organisation. Catering. So once again, we can go back to our cultural backgrounds. Some cultural backgrounds choose not to eat certain foods or to have certain foods prepared a certain way. So we need to be sensitive towards those cultures and cater towards their needs as well. Personal care. So this is where they've got the choice to decide whether they wanna have a shower or if they wanna have a bath. The physical environment. They can complain that their physical environment isn't kept clean and safe and that there's room for them to have a trip hazard or a fall. They have the right to complain that something is leaking or something's not working properly. And the communication of quality. So this is where they have the right to complain if they're not being communicated towards in a timely manner about their care. We're going to go on to discuss about the delivery services ensuring the rights of the older person are upheld. So they're based upon the five following principles, which is independence, participation, care, self-fulfillment and dignity. We want to ensure equality across the board with all our clients. So this is whether they've got a disability, a chronic illness, uh, different financial backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. We want to ensure that they feel 
equal and they feel part of something across the entire board. We want to recognise signs consistent with financial, physical or emotional abuse and neglect. So how do we do this? Abuse just doesn't come down to having a look to see if someone's got bruises on them. We want to be able to see if there's any issue with anyone that they're involved with, if they're starting to fear away from them, if they become depressed knowing that someone is coming around, if their bills aren't getting paid on in a timely manner, but they used to be. All these sorts of things we're going to observe and we're going to document down into their progress notes and inform our supervisor of them because it's going to need to be investigated further. Symptoms of abuse. So it could be anything from change in personality, it could be different behaviour, there could be the visual signs of abuse. But just ensure that it's not just about what you can see on the outside. You need to look deeper and you need to have that open line of communication with your client for them to feel comfortable with talking to you. So next we're going to talk about the general physical changes associated with ageing. So as we can all see, the skin doesn't become as bright and as taut as what it used to be. We start to develop some wrinkles and some sagging. But it's not just that, it's not just what you can see on the outside. If we have a look on the inside, our hearing changes, our eyesight changes, our taste changes, everything gets a little bit more diminished. Our hair and nails don't grow like they used to and they sort of go a bit grey. Our hormones start to change. We don't have that vibrant going through our body anymore. Our teeth and gums, as you'll often see with the elderly, they will have a set of dentures. Our face, our body shape and our skin, we'll often see we start to develop skin tags or liver spots. We can also see the changes in our bones and joints. The way that we move isn't as sprightly as what it used to be. We might need some assistance to get around and that's okay. Common conditions for the elderly, so arthritis. This is going to affect the mobility. Diabetes, becoming frail, heart and lung disease, incontinence, skin disorders, so this could be things like your skin cancers, uh, stroke or CVA, and vascular diseases. Okay, next we're going to talk about to promote the health and reablement of older people. So identify strategies and opportunities that maximise engagement and promote healthy lifestyle practices. So, healthy lifestyle practices, this comes down to getting them moving, getting them walking around if possible, getting some light, gentle exercises, and we're going to pair that with a healthy diet. A lot of time their appetite has subsided with age, so they're not as hungry because they're not doing as much moving as what they used to. But we need to make sure that we're getting that nutrition into them. Social and recreational activities are vital for the elderly. As I've said previously, they need to feel like they have a purpose and getting up and having a social life is part of that purpose. Next, we're going to identify and utilize aids and modifications that promote individual strengths. So this could be things like home modifications. So a walk-in shower, having a rail in the shower for them to feel safe and secure, having a rail next to the toilet for them to assist them to get up having a ramp put in, having non-slip mats put in, modified cutlery and crockery for them to still be able to use a knife and fork, modified cups so that they can still grab the handles. Financing aids and modifications. So there's a lot of government subsidy out there for the elderly and disabled clients and they can access this through an ACAT assessment. So potential risks associated with ageing. So the first thing we tend to think about is falls. They're not as stable on their feet as they used to be and with that unfortunately comes a lot of falls. We also find that a lot of the elderly tend to get lost um, and that's why we need to be part of their wellbeing system is to be able to go out and assist and ensure that they can get home safely and they unfortunately become victims of crime. Okay, so you'll see in this unit you have a major activity. So this should take you between one and two hours to complete and will be found at the end of your workbook. 
Your trainer will let you know whether they need you to complete this in a different time frame other than the time frame that you've been assigned for that unit. So once again, thank you for jumping in and listening to what I've got to say about the overview of this unit. And I hope that you guys really enjoy this unit. If you have any questions, queries or qualms, please don't hesitate to contact your trainer as we're here to help you along the way. Thanks guys.